Welcome to another message from Columbus First Assembly. Thanks for listening as we strive to learn and live the Word and ways of God. Our hope is that you're encouraged by today's message. Two weeks ago, I spoke about how we can experience and live in God's peace. And I thought it was a one-shot message. You know, I thought that the, what the Holy Spirit put on my heart was good. But after I preached the message and over the past couple of weeks, I felt the gentle tug of God to take it one step farther. And that's what we're going to do today. It is my personal belief that there is a hunger inside every person to live in peace. There is a hunger inside every one of us to live in peace. And when that peace isn't there... We long for it. We long for completeness. We long for fulfillment. We long for peace. There is a hunger inside of us. And do you know, God understands that hunger and has made it available. Listen to the words of Jesus from John chapter 14, verse 27. Jesus said, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. Do you know that Jesus has left you and I with a gift? That gift is available. Have you received his gift, peace of mind and heart? And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. And then Paul talking about the issue of peace in the book of Philippians chapter 4 verses 6 and 7 says this, don't worry about anything, instead pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done and his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. God's peace is available. In fact, here's uh, one of my key thoughts this morning. It is God's will for his children to experience and live in peace. I highlighted two words. It is God's will for his children, that's you and I, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that is us this morning, it is God's will for you this morning to experience and then live in. It's not to be a one-time experience or an occasional thing, it's to be a place that we live. It is God's will for his children to experience and live in his peace. But the second key thought that is um, uh, putting these messages together is this, as it comes up on the screen. Biblical peace is a byproduct of doing other things. In the first week when I preached this two weeks ago, I said, don't pray for peace. I mean, there's nothing wrong with praying for peace, but most of us are praying for something that God says is acquired in another way. Peace is a byproduct of doing other things. So I'm going to briefly review some of my uh, key thoughts, and then I'm going to get into the content today. Biblical peace is far more than the absence of stress or the absence of pressure. You can actually be at peace in the middle of tension, stress, and the feelings of, of chaos or feelings of being overwhelmed by what's going on in our culture. Sometimes you and I are not living in peace because of the circumstances around us and our focus on those circumstances, but sometimes you and I are not living at peace because of the emotional and relational pain which we are currently experiencing or have experienced in our past. And this is what we're going to talk about today. Sometimes you and I are not living at peace because of the emotional and relational pain which you are currently experiencing or have experienced in the past. You can experience and live in God's peace in the middle of pain. And so that's why I've entitled the message this morning, Scarred, but finding peace in your pain. Scarred, finding peace in your pain. I don't believe there is a person on planet Earth. Maybe there is. I just don't believe that there are. There is a person on planet Earth that does not have some internal scarring, some wounds that have come about from our past the life that we have lived, what people have done, what people have not done. And so we get scarred and we have pain. We have relational pain. We have emotional pain. We have, some of us have pain of rejection, uh, pain of abuse. I don't believe that any person can escape this life without emotional pain and the scars it leaves behind. 
But the good news this morning is you can experience and live in God's peace in the middle of pain. And so I want to take you back to the key verse that I am preaching from, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. If you can find it in your paper Bible, just so that you can underline it, you can highlight it, you can dog ear the page, whatever it is, it's up on the screen. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, whose thoughts are fixed on you. Do you hear what it says? You, and that you is God, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, whose thoughts are fixed on you. Now, throughout this past couple of weeks, there were three words, three key words that I believe the Holy Spirit dropped in my heart that I'm going to focus on today. They're not the only words why we have a lack of peace in our hearts, but the three words are these, bitterness, unforgiveness, and offense. Bitterness, unforgiveness, and offense. Hear me. You cannot live in God's peace fully if you live in bitterness, unforgiveness, or hold on to offenses. You will not live, you will not experience and live in God's peace if in your heart is bitterness, unforgiveness, and offenses. These things will rob you of God's peace. The minds and hearts of many people, even God's people, are often in turmoil. And they'll get a season of reprieve uh, for a, a minute or two or a day or two or even a week or two. But we fall back into this place because of what resides within us, the many things that have impacted us emotionally or relationally. So since it is not God's will for us to live this way, it is his will for us to experience and live in perfect peace, let's take a look once again at what this perfect peace is and how to achieve it. The Hebrew word for peace is the uh, word shalom, and it is a word that has a very broad meaning. It doesn't just mean peace. It actually can mean peace, harmony, wholeness, completeness, prosperity, welfare, and tranquility. It means all of those, and one author said it is actually all of those combined. The Hebrew word shalom is almost impossible to translate into English properly because it has so much nuance in its meaning, but it is really wholeness and completeness and welfare. And in Isaiah 26, the Bible says that you, meaning God, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, whose thoughts are fixed on you. As I mentioned to you two weeks ago, and you can certainly listen to that message, it's online, perfect peace is the way that the English translators translated shalom, shalom. Because in the Hebrew, it says God will keep in shalom, shalom, those who trust in you, whose thoughts are fixed on you. Two words, the same word back to back. And in English, the best way that they were able to capture what this uh, passage of Scripture is trying to communicate is to call it perfect peace. But basically, it is shalom, shalom. Where God wants you to live, where God wants me to live, is in perfect peace, in shalom, shalom. So how do we get there? Remember, I said that perfect peace is a result of something else. It's in the verse. Perfect peace is a result of us trusting in God and keeping our thoughts fixed on Him. Perfect peace is a result of trusting in God and fixing our thoughts on Him. This is the supernatural key to living in 2020. To live in 2020 with all of the uncertainty and with all of the chaos and with all of the things that are, taking, uh, that are happening in our world the supernatural key to living in 2020 in perfect peace is doing what Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3 says. And the supernatural key to living in peace in your pain and to have peace in your scars is also here in Isaiah 26 3. So here's one of my points this morning. Perfect peace is yours when you continually 
Trust God and keep your thoughts fixed on him. Perfect peace is yours when you continually trust God and keep your thoughts fixed on him. I highlighted the word continually because I think most of us can occasionally, most of us from time to time can get ourselves focused in on God and trusting God, but perfect peace is ours when we continually trust God and keep our thoughts fixed on him. Sub point, actually two statements coming up on the screen. If you continually do God-focused, thought-fixing activities, perfect peace will come. If you fail to continually do God-focused, thought-fixing activities, the promised perfect peace will elude you. You may have some non-stressed out days, but many, many, many of them will not be. You may have some non-painful days, but many, many, many of them will not be because the key to experiencing and walking in God's perfect peace is to continually do God-focused, thought-fixing activities. So the question is this. What are you focused on? When you are not really monitoring your thinking, what are you focused on? What are your thoughts fixed on? Two weeks ago, we talked about how it is very uh, common nowadays that our thoughts would be fixed on our problems. Our thoughts would be fixed on uh, the, the world situation. Our thoughts would be fixed on the financial situation. Our thoughts may be fixed naturally on our job and its security or lack thereof, on our income, whether we're in uh, ex having unemployment right now. There's a lot of things that can be impacting our thoughts, external circumstances, but if that's all we're thinking about, and I'm just going to drop this thought out there, if that's all you're listening to, some of you would help your peace by shutting off your internet and staying off of the feeds and staying off of the news feeds. Some of you would help your peace if you would turn off Fox News or CNN or NPR or whatever your favorite news source is. But you've got it on and you're constantly feeding into yourself, which is causing your mind to fix on these things. There was an interesting poll. It was on the Internet. It's got to be true, right, if it was on the Internet, right? Right? Okay. Okay. That's good preaching. <laughs> I wish I had the time to have verified it. But I guess a poll was done amongst Americans and amongst those around the world as to how many people have actually contracted COVID-19 and how many people have actually died from the disease. And according to this, which is on the Internet, which absolutely has to be true, right? You go verify it for me. But I thought it was fascinating that... In supposedly this poll that was taken, 20 per, Americans as a whole say about 20% of the population has caught it and 9% has died. And it's actually a little over 1% of the population has caught it and only 0.4% have actually died. Why would we say 20% have caught it? And actually, in other places around the world, the, the percentages were higher, according to this thing that was on the Internet, which we know is true. And since I'm quoting it, which is also going to be on the Internet, I've just given some credibility to it. Here's why I use that example. Because it monopolizes the news. It monopolizes social media. It monopolizes our thoughts. And because it's monopolizing our thoughts... Our heart is fixed there, and so we think that the repercussions of it are possibly worse than they are. Now, I still don't like the fact that some people have died from this. Uh, maybe one of your loved ones has been sick. Some of you have told me horrendous stories about people that you know that have had the disease and recovered from the disease. Some of you yourself, you've had your own experience with COVID-19, and uh, from what I hear, it wasn't a pleasant experience. But at the same time, because of the focus that has been given and the fact that our lives have been impacted to the, the fact that after I finish preaching and when I go to praying for folks, I will have a mask on. Uh, when I'm out in the lobby, I have a mask on. Because of the focus that has been given to this, I think many people feel that its impact, if this 
poll, which is on the internet, which we know is correct and true and everything that's out there, if this poll is correct, we could see just a subtle way of how the focus on something actually causes it to appear larger than it is. If you continually do God-focused, thought-fixing activities, perfect peace will come. But if you fail to continually do God-focused, thought-fixing activities, the promised perfect peace will elude you. So this week, I want to talk about something that I think is far too common in way too many people's lives. It is very difficult to control. I will share a personal illustration of this at the close of my message. But we're going to talk about things like bitterness, Unforgiveness and offense. See, what you are fixed on will impact how much peace you experience. What you are fixed on will impact how much peace you will experience. And if you're fixed on these things, if you're fixed on offense, rejection, hurt, abuse, uh, being taken advantage of, or being overlooked in some way, could you bring those words up, please? If you are fixing and focusing on these things, it will impact the amount of peace that you will feel. The Bible says offenses will come, but there's a difference between an offense and being offended. Being offended is a choice. There will be hurts, there will be rejection, there will be abuses of some type. You will be taken advantage of. And if you're young enough like some of these up here in the front row and yet you have not yet been taken advantage of, I will guarantee it will happen at some point in your life. Somebody will take advantage of you and it hurts when they do. You'll be overlooked for something. And because of that, if we're not careful, it gets into our minds and it gets into our hearts and our mind and our heart will gravitate towards that. It will fixate on it. And this is why God is telling us that if we're going to live in perfect peace, we have to choose to trust him and choose to fix our thoughts on him continually. I don't know who I'm speaking to today. Just everybody give me your attention because I want to talk very specifically to someone or someone's here or possibly someone that's watching online today. Somebody or several bodies, your workplace has caused many of the things that are on the screen. You've been offended at work. You've been taken advantage of at work. You've been overlooked at work. Maybe you've been overworked at work. Um, you feel abused at work, uh, you feel misunderstood at work, uh, you have felt rejection at work. And, and what I felt the Holy Spirit just gently say to me is, watch out, watch out. You're losing your peace. You're losing your peace because, and this is, make, this is why it makes it very hard. You have to go to work tomorrow. And when you go to work tomorrow, you're going to put yourself in the environment where the pressure and the offense and the abuse and the feelings of rejection, maybe somebody stepped over you or on top of you to climb the ladder and you get there and now they're your supervisor and maybe you were better qualified. And every time that you walk in the door of the place where you are employed, the fixation and the focus is on your hurt or on what took place. Be careful because you will not be able to live in this perfect peace, this shalom, shalom that God has if you can't release those things. And we'll talk about that in just a couple of minutes. But I just wanted to say that there's somebody or more than one here who is dealing with some work-related issues. And during this time when work is kind of rough on a lot of people, it is easy to let this stuff lodge in our heart. And then what we do is at work, we're focused on it. After work, we're focused on it. Before we go to bed, we're focused on it. Sometimes we're focused on it in our dreams. Have you ever woke up from one of those dreams that has been just <laughs> um, fueled by work? And then when you get up the next day, the one thing that you have to do is you have to go to work and then you're fixed again. You will keep it perfect peace those who trust you and whose thoughts are fixed on you. We need to fix our thoughts. 
Fix our thoughts. Fix our thoughts on our Lord and on God. A couple of passages regarding forgiveness. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, Jesus said, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Notice it says refuse to. There are some people that actually have refused to forgive. And if our Father will not forgive our sins at that point, that will point, that will take away some peace. I don't know exactly how to interpret this passage, what that means. There's a lot of interpretation, but this is just Jesus' words. If you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive you. And then in, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, the Apostle Paul says, Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. We don't have any exception or excuse. Just as God in Christ has forgiven us. How did God forgive me? Totally and completely, freely. I didn't earn it. I don't deserve it as we sing in them one song. He has totally and completely forgiven me. That's the way he wants us to forgive others. Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, tenderhearted forgiving one another just as God through Christ, has forgiven you. And then two passages just briefly on offense. In Proverbs chapter 17, verse 9, whoever would foster love covers over an offense, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. If you want to foster love in relationships, if you want to foster love on the job, cover over the offense. And then in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11, a person's wisdom yields patience, and it is to one's glory to overlook an offense. Offenses will come. Will you choose to overlook them? Will you foster love by covering over an offense? It's tough. So how do we forgive? How do we wrestle out of this bitterness? How do we not become offended even if we receive offense. So I'm just going to briefly go through a few things here, and then I'll tell you a, a personal story. The first thing I want to tell you is you got to do it one day at a time. One day at a time. You forgive today. Forgive today. One day at a time. I think I'll just camp on the work thing before you go to work on Monday. Whoever or whatever the situations are that you are dealing with that are causing you to lose your peace, on Monday, you go in already having forgiven them. And then maybe when you pull in the parking lot of your place of employment, you forgive again. Because as soon as you get there, you may feel the emotion rise. When you walk in and you're doing pretty good, the perfect peace is there, the shalom, shalom is there, and then out of the corner of your eye, you see that person. I don't know who they are. You do. You forgive again. One day at a time, one bit of forgiveness at a time. Forgive and then forgive again and forgive again. Forgive the offense, forgive the oversight, forgive the rejection, the hurt, the abuse, whatever it is. And then when you see or you feel bitterness coming up, when you feel the offense coming up again, okay? Here's my second suggestion. Cry out to God. You need his help. He is not at all offended that you would cry out to him and say, God, I need help. I don't want to live bitter. I don't want to live unforgiving. I don't want to live with this offense. I need your help. Cry out to God. Pray to him and say, help me, God. I don't want to miss out on your perfect peace. Cry out to him. Cry out to him for help to obey his commands. He says, forgive. It says, um, as God in Christ forgave us, he says, forgive. God, help me to do that. I can't do that naturally. None of us can do it naturally, but he can give you the supernatural strength to do it. And then, as you forgive and as you work through this, trust God with the results. Trust God with the results. It is very probable that the person who did whatever it was to you, okay, does not deserve to be forgiven. 
But forgiveness is never deserved. Forgiveness is a gift that we offer just as it was offered to us. They actually may have stepped over you and on you consciously and purposely. They saw you as a weak link and they saw it to where they wanted to go and they did it purposely. They don't deserve to be forgiven, but that is not what the Bible says for us as children of God that we need to do. That person who left you, that person who rejected you, that person who didn't follow through on what they said they would do, swearing on a stack of Bibles, still needs to be forgiven. They don't deserve it. But we do it because our God has commanded us to do it. And then we need to trust God with the results. Reverend Chris Beal said this, and I'm going to put it up on the screen. Uh, you may want to take a picture of this. Uh, we don't have note sheets now, or I would have had it in a note sheet to you. But I, I think that his understanding of forgiveness is so key. When you apply forgiveness one day at a time, one remembrance at a time, what happens to you, or excuse me, what happened to you will no longer be an emotion. It will only be a fact. When you apply forgiveness one day at a time, one remembrance at a time, what happened to you will no longer be an emotion. It will only be a fact. That's when you know that you have pressed through and you're breaking through the prison of unforgiveness and bitterness. When you can think about the issue and now it's a fact and no longer an emotion. And that happens when you forgive, you apply forgiveness one day at a time, one remembrance at a time. Charles F. Glassman says this, forgiving someone may cost you your pride, but not forgiving them will cost you your freedom. And it will certainly cost you your peace. I knew a believer many years ago who cried out to God all the time for peace and, and, and wholeness in their life. And they were constantly seeking God that he would open these things up to them. But as I got to know them, I saw and experienced from time to time this rush of yuck <laughs> that would come out of them that was tied to old hurts and unforgiveness and bitterness and it became very apparent to me why they lacked what they kept crying out to God for, peace, wholeness, security. Because what they wanted was the result of something else. And they did try to focus and fix their thoughts on God. They spent great amounts of time in God's word. They spent great amounts of time in prayer. But what was blocking their ability to live in the perfect peace was a heart that did not release and could not release the wounds from the past. Now, I'm not going to be trite this morning. I've heard some people that would say when you have a hurt or when you have an offense or when there's something going on in your life, just let it go. In fact, I think some of them would like to sing the Frozen song. Let it go. You know, just let it go. Or... They're not worth it. You know, where they're trying to just let you just get rid of it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give you something trite like that. It is hard to let it go. In fact, you need supernatural help to let it go. You need God's way of letting it go. Forgiveness every day, maybe multiple times a day. Because when something gets inside of me, it comes up again and again and again and again. And when I think I've let it go, there it is again. And when it comes up, it's like I can't stop thinking about it. Any of you thought about um, a chocolate donut yet today? Any of you thought about one? Now you have. And guess what? You'll think about it from now till probably tonight. Why? You weren't thinking about it. But see, that's what happens to me. When all of a sudden the memory comes back or the, the thing, then all of a sudden I can't not think about it. There was a situation uh, Sherry and I experienced many, many, many years, decades ago. 
I hadn't thought about this for a long time, and all of a sudden, boom, the thought came back. I don't know why the thought came back. I don't know what reminded me of the situation, but for the rest of the day, I couldn't stop thinking about it. It's not easy to let these things go. That's why you can't let it go. You have to attack them. You have to focus and fix yourself on God and God's solution. You have to trust him by forgiving and forgiving and releasing and praying and praying. The way to stop is to fix yourself on God. Friday, just a couple of days ago, an offense came into my mind and my thoughts. I dismissed it because I had other things to do. And as soon as I had that moment when my mind wasn't fixed on something, it was back. It came up a few times. I began to see my mind going towards that offense, going towards those feelings that I had. So what did I do? I prayed. I forgave again. And I refused to fix my thoughts on that situation and that offense. I was going to forgive and I was going to pray. Then on Saturday, it wanted to come up again. Maybe just so that I could give you an illustration on Sunday morning as to what I dealt with on Friday and Saturday. On Saturday, it wanted to come back up again. The offense, the situation, the hurt. And what I started to do, uh, again, I forgave, I fixed my thoughts on God. I started to play, pray God's blessing upon that person. I just started to pray God's blessing upon that person and I desired that they would discover how to become incredible in God. Because most of us cannot just let go. We have to, get, we have to work very hard in releasing, forgiving, submitting ourselves for healing. Praying blessing is just one of the ways that it helps me. You just say, God... You've got this. I want them to become incredible men, women of God, whoever they may be. Maybe it's going back to work. Maybe it's a supervisor. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe they're not even believers. Can you pray God's blessing upon them that they would find Jesus, that they would find their own forgiveness? that they would find healing and wholeness in their life? Would you pray those blessings on people? What happens is the emotion of your own hurt begins to dissipate. It's the way to get yourself from fixing on that to fixing on God. Remember what Isaiah said. You will keep in perfect peace those who trust you. You've got to trust God's method, forgiveness and blessing and release. Those who trust you whose thoughts are fixed upon you. Keep your thoughts fixed on God. Keep your heart full of the things of God, the Word of God, prayer, the promises of God, and see what God would do. Because for the most part, we just can't let something go. Really, we can't. If it got inside of you, you just can't let it go, and it's not a good idea to push it down. You need to walk through God's process because, remember, it is God's will for you to experience, but this is the words, and live in his perfect peace. It is God's will for you to experience and live in shalom, shalom. And it is possible. God doesn't make a promise. That is not possible. And I don't think it's difficult from the standpoint that it's going to take a horrendous amount of emotional energy but it will take some obedience and it will take bearing some pride and it will take a lot of forgiveness. We need to fix our thoughts on God. So whether you're fixing your thoughts on external circumstances or internal pain, you need to turn your thoughts and fix them on God. For more help in this area, I'm just going to re re reference two resources. Uh, one is a Jimmy Evans book called When Life Hurts. And the second is an older book that has been in my library for several decades. I've read it, I believe, personally three to four times, and I recommend it to many, Healing for Damaged Emotions. Both of these books will be helpful because the journey of freedom 
from the inner hurts, the rejections, the deep wounds. And I am not trying to gloss over. Some people, maybe even some of you, have such deep wounds that you're not even sure you want to go there. But God says, yes, I want you to go there with me. Because there is a place of peace. There is a place of blessing that God wants you to go to, but it can only be achieved as you follow his path, as you trust him, and as you fix your thoughts on him. As the team makes their way back to the platform, would you bow your heads with me today? Lord, that promise in Isaiah 26 is so appealing that you're going to keep us in perfect peace. You will keep us in perfect peace as we trust in you and as we fix our thoughts on you. God, in Jesus' name, I pray that something that I say today would lodge into the heart of each person who needs what I'm talking about. And that that will be their starting point. Their starting point of walking through this journey. Of finding shalom, shalom, perfect peace. We love you, Lord, and we appreciate you. Your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you that Jesus loves us so much that he made it available to us. He said, I leave you a gift. Peace. Not as the world gives, but as he gives. So this gift can be ours, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You've been listening to a message from Columbus First Assembly. We hope that you've been encouraged in your spiritual journey. If you're not part of a local church and would like to attend one of our regular services, our church is located at the corner of 10th and Iowa Street in Columbus, Indiana. Our Sunday morning worship services start at 10 a.m. and our Wednesday evening studies begin at 7 p.m. And while you're online, check out our website at columbusfirstassembly.org for details and information about our church. You will also find other messages and series that you can listen to or download. Thanks for spending some time with us and for taking advantage of this resource from Columbus First Assembly, where we strive to learn and live the word and ways of God.